book of Acts, chapter number 24. And we're going to keep making our way through the book of Acts, chapter by chapter this morning. We're going to preach through chapter 24. And by the grace of God, we're going to cover the entire chapter today, beginning to verse number 1. So if I can ask you to please bow your heads with me at the beginning here, we're going to pray and ask God for help, and then we'll dig right into the sermon. Father, thank you this morning for the privilege of singing these songs, and Lord, I hope, I hope we've told the truth this morning. Oh, how I love Jesus. Thank you, God, for reminding us of these things, these wonderful truths. And I pray that you please have your hand upon what's going to be said now. Would you please come down and meet with us? Father, we may not be able to see you physically, but might we know that you're here. And we ask for your help in all this endeavor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, chapter 24, verse number 1. Let me remind you of the setting. Paul has been arrested And you might remember last week we preached from chapter 23 about Paul's sister's son, who that little boy who carried the message and ended up saving Paul's life as a result of it. And he has been whisked off to Caesarea where he is going to stand trial now and give an answer before the council. And he's going to have an official accusation made and so forth in Caesarea. Now, I would like to introduce you to the three main characters that you read about in this chapter. There are a few others mentioned, but there are three main characters. And these characters actually have their words, something they said, recorded in the chapter. So we're going to talk about Tertullus, we're going to talk about Paul, we're going to talk about a man named Felix. But the name of my sermon is The Unseen Visitor. The unseen visitor. There are three very visible people in this chapter. But there's one character that is not so visible but very real and very present. And we're going to spend, Lord willing, the majority of our time talking about this unseen visitor. Chapter 24 and verse number 1. It says, After five days Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus who informed the governor against Paul. Now, Tertullus, he is what you and I would consider an advocate or a lawyer. He is a professional speaker, and they have chosen the best of the best to make this formal accusation against Paul because they believe that they're going to take him down in so doing. So verse number 2, And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. You can hear him kind of waxing eloquent here. That, that, have you ever listened to people in Parliament when they speak? They don't sound real genuine, do they? People usually don't talk like that if they're just talking to their friends and so forth. This is a very official situation. And if I can just put it plainly, Tertullus is kissing up. (laughs) That's what he's doing. I mean, look at the words he used. We enjoy great quietness. And that very worthy deeds. All these extra adjectives and adverbs. Verse number 4, Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. I don't know. I kind of think he said it more like this. Not that I be not further tedious unto thee. I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. <laughs> Every time I read this chapter, that's how I picture Tertullus saying, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be offensive. That's just how I read that. And, and, and then after he has kissed up to Felix and said what he needed to say, in verse number 5, the actual accusation begins. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow. Now that's a very, well, not very, but it is the nicer way of saying this guy is a pest. This guy's getting on our nerves. This Paul fellow is bothering us. Now how is it that Paul is being a pest? Everywhere that Paul went, if you've read the book of Acts, if you've been with us as we've gone through it, every town that he went to, the first stop was a synagogue. 
And he'd go into a synagogue and he'd sit through the Jewish service. And then at the end of a Jewish service, they opened the floor that if anybody wants to speak, they were allowed to stand up and say something. That was Paul's open door. And Paul would stand up and he would begin to use the Old Testament to prove that Jesus was in fact the Christ, that there were promises about the resurrection from the dead and that Jesus fulfilled it. And of course, many people were converted right there in the Jewish synagogues. And this was getting on the nerves of the Jewish uppity ups. So he said, we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. Come on now, Tertullus, has, has Paul been everywhere in the world? Uh, he's kind of exaggerating that just a little bit. But sedition, now that's a, that's a pretty uh, big crime to level against him. Sedition is instigating a rebellion against a government. Now Paul wasn't guilty of that. The Jews didn't even have their own government. They were controlled by the Romans at this time. So he's blowing it out of proportion. What he's basically saying is that Paul is a divisive pest. Paul is causing division within uh, the Jewish culture because some were converting. So Paul is seen as a bit divisive. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, And a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Now this was a very popular name for Christians in the early church in the first century. They were called Nazarenes because Jesus was from Nazareth. That's where he grew up. And so Jesus' followers were referred to as Nazarenes for some time. And he says Paul is the ringleader. You know, when you use the word ringleader, it makes it sound like a circus. Yes, the ringleader. And they had circuses back in those days. So he said he's the ringleader of this sect. A sect is another way of saying a cult. Saying Paul is the leader of this cult. And uh, in verse number 6, who, has also, uh, who also has gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law, that's the uh, Sanhedrin law, but the chief captain Lysias came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee, by examining of whom thou, uh, thyself rather, mayest take knowledge of all these things, whereof We accuse him, and the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. So everybody in the courtroom is cheering, yes, yes, that's right, he's a pest, he's a divisive man. Now this accusation about profaning the temple, if you know chapter 21, that wasn't Paul's intention, was it? He didn't go there to profane the temple. He went in there and paid for the vow, shaved his head, and was actually following Jewish custom to the T. He was doing the exact opposite of profaning the temple. You know what I see Tertullus as in this, in this chapter? He is a picture-perfect example of the world. This is how the world views a Bible-believing Christian who actually lives out his faith. The world is going to see us not as somebody trying to help, but as a pest as a divisive man who's out to overthrow the traditions of the area. That's what they're saying Paul is doing. Uh, Jesus actually predicted this would happen. Let me give you the verse, you just have to listen to it. In John 15, 19, Jesus said, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, listen to this part, therefore the world hateth you. Now here's what a lot of Christians do when they, when they come across a verse like that. They say, let's fix it. If the world hates us, let's compromise and do whatever we need to do so that they like us. Guys, I just want to remind you this morning, it's not our job to win a popularity contest. It's not, it's not our motive. We're not trying to make people hate us by any means. We're trying to simply be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Bible. But as you do that, you're going to find some people that accuse you of being a pest, of being divisive, of being part of a cult. And all you're trying to do is overthrow and rebel against the traditions. That's not how we do it. That's not how... We're, bless God, we are South Africans and this is how we do it. And any, it's strange the definition that people have for a cult. Listen, I've written a book on cults. I'm I'm aware of the proper definition, but this is how most people 
think of a cult. Anybody that doesn't believe like me is in a cult. <laughs> if you don't agree with me, you're in a cult. How many of you have ever been accused of joining a cult since you've come to this church? <laughs> I, I have received nasty emails, threatening emails, people pr promising to pray down the judgment of God and wipe me out because of being such a divisive pest that is overthrowing the South African way of worshiping God. It's, it was never my intention to come and do that. But I did have this goal to step in and say, thus saith the Lord, and then show you from the Bible so that, listen, you can make a decision. One of the earmarks of a cult is to say, I will decide for you, and if you don't fall in line with me, you're going to hell. Folks, your relationship with Jesus Christ, your relationship with God does not depend on me. I am simply a vessel. I'm going to do my best to show you from the Bible what's right and what's not, but then at the end of the day, you need to search the Scriptures. You need to decide whether or not you're going to follow Christ that is not something that I can do for you. So this is Tertullus. Strangely enough, they have accused Paul of being this divisive man. Do you remember in Acts 21 why Paul went to the temple? He went to Jerusalem because he wanted to win Jews to Christ. When he got there, James said, there's a bunch of confusion about what you're teaching. Would you please set the record straight, go into the temple and show them that you are not against Jewish culture. There is nothing wrong with Jewish culture. There's nothing, listen please, there's nothing wrong with Afrikaner culture. There's nothing wrong with American culture. You may not agree with that statement, but there really isn't. There's nothing wrong with Malawian culture, Tswana culture, Zulu culture. Culture is culture. There's nothing wrong with that. Paul wanted to show the, to the people there's nothing wrong with being Jewish by descent and living within a Jewish society. That's okay. That's okay. He actually went into the temple not to burn the bridge, but to build it. He actually wanted to show the people how they could connect. But the outside world didn't view it like that. And because Paul was going to stand his ground, Paul was willing to say, your culture is one thing, but where your culture doesn't line up with the Bible, then you need to go against your culture and line up with the Bible. As soon as he brought that out, the people reacted in such a way as to say, kill him, get him out of here, he's a pest. Guys, it's not my goal to, to condemn all of your culture at all. It's my goal to give you the Word of God and then hopefully, by His grace, you line up with that. That's Tertullus. He represents the world. Now the second character, the Apostle Paul, verse number 10. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, Forasmuch as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. So he's saying, Felix, since you've been around a while, you are fit to judge this situation, and I'm glad I have this chance. Verse 11, Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Verse 14, But this I confess unto thee. So now this... Of all the things they've accused me of doing, this I will agree with. That the, after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. Now look at what kind of a worshiper Paul was. At the end of verse 14, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. You know what Paul says? He said, I am a Bible-believing worshiper of God. Folks, I'm not stretching that. I didn't make that up. That's exactly what he said. I believe all things that are written and I'm worshiping God according to what I read in the Bible. Tradition, culture, they call it heresy. I call it worshiping God. I call it Bible-believing religion. That's the Apostle Paul. He goes on to say in verse 15, And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. Let me point this out to you as well. When we, when we look at Paul 
And I believe he would represent the, devo- the, the devoted, dedicated, on-fire Christian. He is going to worship God according to the Bible. That's going to be the emphasis in his life. In verse number 15, he mentions the resurrection. Paul lived as if the resurrection was a real thing. L- let me drive that point a little deeper with you. Do you live as if Jesus actually rose from the dead? Is, is the resurrection of Jesus real to you or is he just a figure that you have painted on the wall somewhere? Is he just a figment of your imagination or is he a living being that walks with you and talks with you on a daily basis? Is he alive? Did he rise? And if so, do you act like it? Let me uh, drive it even further home One day, listen, when you die, that's not the end of you. You realize that after death, your body is going to lay in the grave, but one day you're going to be called forth from that grave. The Bible says in a moment, in in a shout, the Lord comes Himself and He takes the dead in Christ and we which are alive and remain, we get caught up. One day you're going to stand before God. Do you live as if that resurrection is going to happen? The Apostle Paul did. He said, I read in my Bible that there's going to be a resurrection and I am living as if that resurrection's real. That's the second group. Look at verse 16. Another thing about Paul. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Paul not only lived according to the Bible, but he also was very sensitive to his conscience. And this is something very unique to Paul. Of all the other men in the Bible, if you put all of them together, they do not mention the conscience as much as Paul. Now you understand, the revelation of God that we can hold in our hand is a Bible. But God has also written in our hearts right and wrong. We have that moral compass built into us. Friends, we can't ignore that. As you get into doing something or you're starting to make a decision, you need to be sensitive when you feel God poking at that moral compass saying, hey, I don't want that to happen. You shouldn't make this decision. Paul was sensitive not only to what was in his hands, but to how God was working in his heart. Let me point something out again in verse 16. He says, herein, at the beginning here, herein do I exercise myself. Now, he's not talking about having a virgin active membership, right? He's not, it's not that kind of exercise. What he's mentioning here is, I actually do something about what I believe. Friend, can we, can we say that about you? Do you actually do something about what you believe? It's become a very real thought to me, and at one point in the near future, I may not be able to speak anymore. When I was on this little vacation to Pretoria... I thought I could get away with it. I sang in church on Sunday morning while I was in Pretoria. I sang just about three songs. And after that, my throat was on fire. I didn't say another word for the rest of that day. From 11.30 a.m. for the rest of that Sunday, I didn't say another word. And all of Monday, I didn't say another word. Not one word. That's almost a miracle. For a preacher, that's almost a miracle. Not one word, not one sound came from my mouth. It is the first time since I learned how to talk that I didn't say anything for an entire day. I had a lot of time to think. And the thought crossed my mind, I wonder, I wonder if I could still show somebody that I'm a Christian not being able to speak. I wonder if I could live it enough so that they would know I'm a Christian, if I would exercise my Christianity in such a way that it would be known. Let me, let me put it a different way. Paul is on trial, yes? Is, is he on trial? Is he standing there being accused by an official orator and a, and a lawyer, a man of the law? You know what he's being accused of? Being a Christian. His crime was being a Bible-believing Christian. Could we accuse you of that? If we were to stand you in a court of law and list out the accusations, would you be condemned? Would you be guilty of being a dedicated Christian? Or would we struggle to find evidence to support your claim of being a follower in Christ? I think that's something you want to ponder on. That's what we have in the Apostle Paul. Guilty of Christianity. 
guilty as charged. In verse number 17, he says, Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. Well, that's part of Jewish culture. Verse 18, Whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me. So Paul's saying, listen, your claims are fallacious. There's no, you have no proof for, for what you're saying that I'm doing. But one thing I will admit to is I am doing exactly what the Bible tells me to do. In verse 20, Or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me, while I stood before the council. Verse 21, Except it be for this one voice that I cried, standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. He said, The only thing that they really have on me is that I believe in the resurrection. He said, that's the only thing that I've said it, uh, in, the, in the face of this council that we really need to discuss. So verse number 22, when Felix, now this is going to be our third character. We've looked at Tertullus, we've looked at Paul, and now Felix. When Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. Felix is a governor. He is a politician. And boy, does he play the role well. What does a politician do? A politician is a professional fence straddler. That's what politicians do. The goal is to make everybody happy. That is an unachievable goal. You cannot do it. But that, are, that is what politicians try to do. They want to straddle the fence and make everybody happy. So... Felix really doesn't know what to say about this. This is more of a Jewish matter. It's not really a, a lawful matter. So he says, okay, let me wait for the, uh, the Roman guy, the chief captain, to come down. Then I'll hear it further. Isn't that how politics and government uh, offices work? Let's just keep putting it off and put, oh, fill out another paper and fill out another paper. And we'll have another meeting. And he's just politicking his way through this. Let me point something out about Felix, though. Even though he's a slippery kind of a politician guy, I hope this morning that you don't have too much in common with him. In verse 22, it says he has a more perfect knowledge of that way. This means Felix knew all of the historical facts about Christianity. He knew the claims. He knew that this sect of the Nazarenes had claimed that Jesus rose from the dead. He knew that. He knew that this guy Jesus had died on the cross. He knew that. He knew that Paul and these other apostles were going around in various parts of the world preaching. He knew that. He knew all the facts. Like a lot of you. You've heard the story over and over again. Why, you could probably stand here and do just as good a job as I. Telling the story of what Jesus did and his miracles and how he died and rose again. You know that up here. Well, so did Felix. If you keep reading in verse number 23, it says, And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. This is kind of like a very relaxed house arrest. Caesarea is on the coast in the northwest part of Israel. It's not a bad place to be. Paul was allowed to move about a little bit, have friends come in and talk and fellowship. Uh, Felix is treating him quite well. He was nice to the preacher. He'd show up, hello, Dumini, Khanamet Dumini. Very kind, very congenial, nice guy. But he's a politician. What else would you expect? In verse 24, and after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, female Jew, if you will, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Look at that. Felix set up his own little private church service. He says, uh, I got my wife here. She's Jewish. I bet she would enjoy hearing about all this Jewish conspiracy theory stuff. You know, Drusilla likes to watch those things on YouTube. I bet she'd love to see Paul. I, she'd love to hear what Paul has to say about it. And he organized a private viewing and he sits down and he says, all right, Paul, go ahead and stand there. All right, tell us all about the faith in Christ. Is he sincere? He came to church, but was he sincere? 
Did he, did he bring a visitor? Yeah. He brought a visitor. Well, amen, well done, Felix. But does he really care that this visitor gets saved? No. You know what he's bringing Drusilla for? The entertainment of it. Let's just sit and, and this way we have something to gossip about when we're done. They're not interested in learning something new. They're not interested in changing. They came to church because, well, it's something to do. It's something to fill the time. That's Felix, as we keep reading in verse number 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, which is self-control, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. Isn't this lovely? We have in the Bible Paul's three-point outline. Have you ever wondered why we use three-point outlines? <laughs> There's a three-point outline right there. Righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix trembled and answered. So he's under conviction. He says, go thy way for this time. He says, all right, Paul, all right, all right, that, that, that's enough. Quit singing just as I am. You need to go. <laughs> you don't need to give an invitation. You can go now, Paul. That's fine. We've heard enough. Now look at the last part of verse 25. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. You know what Felix does? He is going to deal with God and deal with biblical matters at his own convenience. Listen, I, I just don't feel right at the moment. I, I, I just, I, I have other things I want to get straightened out first. And whenever I have time for God, then I'll investigate this further and I'll do something about it. But right now, it's not a good time for me. It's not convenient. It's not comfortable. So let me just put this off. Shame, are you more like Paul or are you more like Felix? Verse number 26 tells us a little bit more about Felix's intentions. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul. Oh, you wouldn't think it. You wouldn't think it. And I'm sure it's not happening today. But some people come to church just to get some money. They come to church, maybe it's not to come and directly ask the preacher, give me money, but they come to church because they're hoping for some financial gain or some, some way to make their physical life better. They're really not interested in getting closer to God, but they would very much appreciate it if through their coming to church, God would physically bless their lives. I'm sick, I lost my job, let me come to church so God can fix that. It's all about your personal gain. That's Felix. That's Felix. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him. So this is more of a corruption type thing. He's expecting a little money under the table. You know, Paul, I'm, they used to do this with me in Malawi all the time. The policemen would, they'd pull me over because the road checks, wow, you guys think you have them. Anytime I took a trip in Malawi, I had cash in my hand because they're going to stop me. They're going to take my money one way or the other. So they'd stop and they'd say, ah, today is very hot, eh? Very hot today. Yes, 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 very hot. Yeah, I'm thirsty, ne? Eh? Very thirsty. Ah, you can, can, can you help me? Well, you know what that is. He's asking for me to buy him a Fanta. <laughs> and by buy him a Fanta, he means give me enough money to buy enough for my entire family. <laughs> Which is another way of saying, I won't write you a ticket if you'll buy me this Fanta under the table. <laughs> That's Felix. That's politics. Always trying to find a way to get ahead in life, make a quick buck, to improve his status in life. You know there are a lot of people that use God for that exact thing. They only worship God as long as God continues to bless them. But if God were to take that hedge down from your life as he did with Job, I wonder where we would stand. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. So more and more often, Felix would say, hey, Paul, come on in the office. Let's sit and chat. Hey, Paul, how's it going? Paul, uh, you miss your family? Hey, Paul, you miss those churches? And he's, he's kind of... You know, provoking Paul, trying to get Paul homesick so he'd give him some money. And in verse number 27 it says, But after two years, I, I, I want to say Porcius Festus, but Porcius is just, I, I can't use that name. 
you can't call anybody Porcius. That's like you're trying to make fun of somebody, but you don't know how to, pro- uh, uh, to, to speak properly. Porcius, no. I'm going to say Porcius. I mean, Porsche sounds a lot better, right? So this is Porcius Festus. It's like a Roman guy with a nice car. That's who this is. After two years, Porcius Festus came into Felix's room. So he took his job as governor. And Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. You know what he did? He did what was popular instead of what was right. And as long as it pleased the people, as long as everybody else around him gave him the thumbs up, then he thought, well, that's, that's the way to go. I hope you don't base your decisions and form your life on popular opinion. That's not Paul, that's Felix. We still have a whole lot of Felixes with us today. And listen, they're not all lost politicians. A lot of them are come to church every Sunday members. I want to challenge you today to look deep inside and make sure you're not anything like Felix, but everything like Paul. Now, we've looked at Tertullus, we've looked at Paul, we've talked about Felix. And as far as, I mean, we've read the whole chapter, yes? Did you see the other character that spoke in the chapter? We have something in verse number 9, talks about the Jews agreeing, but we don't know what they said. You have Drusilla, she showed up, but we don't know what she said. Who is this unseen visitor? Well, I read in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 27, I'll just give you the verse, that Moses, when he was up against Pharaoh, the Bible says he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now I want to hear science explain that. How do you see somebody who is invisible? But that's how Moses got through a very difficult time in his life, a very challenging time, as he was able to, if I can say, tune his eyes to see the unseeable. Moses was aware of the unseen visitor. I was always with him. And I think sometimes we can read so quickly through a chapter that we fail to see the unseen visitor. We've read through chapter 24 and maybe you missed it. Where we can find this unseen visitor and I think it's true in life. Sometimes life just gets to moving so fast and there's so much to do that we only see what can be seen And we fail to listen to what Paul said. Paul said, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul said, we need to look at the unseen. How do you do that? How do you see him who is invisible. Well, I'm going to say to you that this fourth character, this unseen visitor in this chapter, is the Holy Ghost. It's the Spirit of God. And and often when the Holy Spirit begins to work, there is kind of a misconception about how he shows up and, and how he operates. Do we read in the book of Acts about a rushing mighty wind? that accompanied the coming of the Spirit? Yes. We read in Acts 4 that the apostles prayed. The disciples, they prayed. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and the room began to shake. Now we read of a couple instances like this and here's what we do. We say, okay, then that means if the Holy Ghost has actually shown up, if we have this heavenly visitor, that means... There's going to be a rushing mighty wind. That means the earth is going to shake beneath our feet. And this is where people begin to try to duplicate that. And they fall on the floor and begin to shake. And these ecstatic utterances. And oh, we've got to get it all worked up. And we've got to act as if the Holy Ghost has come. But my friend, listen, the Spirit of God, yes, yes, there are occasions when something big comes along with that. But the Spirit of God can also be working speaking in a very still, small way. You don't have to have the theatrics to have God 
touch somebody's heart. Maybe you've come and you say, Man, I didn't feel the Holy Ghost here today because where was the band? We didn't all get up and jump around and dance around during the music. So I didn't feel the Holy Ghost. Pastor Mike hasn't gotten loud and yelled and raised his voice and ran around the building. No one's come forward. We haven't laid hands on anybody. We haven't, hop-a-da, hop-a-da. We haven't had any of that. Where's the Holy Ghost? Well, in verse number 25, I'd like to show you where we might have found him. In verse number 25, it says in the middle there, Felix trembled. Folks, why do you think he trembled? You think he trembled because the Apostle Paul is standing there explaining Paul's own opinion? Of course not. Brother, sister, the finger of God came down and was placed right there on Felix's heart. And for the first, Felix hadn't taken it serious. He had heard about the faith of Christ. He had perfect knowledge about this religion and he never took it seriously. And for for just a a plain little umblek, ooh, the finger of God got in there. The Spirit of God reached down there and touched his heart and he said, wow. Did the room shake? Was there a, did the doors blow open with a rushing mighty wind? No. But something inside of Felix grabbed a hold of him. And Felix trembled. We want to see all these big things that God can do and sometimes that causes us to miss this unseen visitor that comes around in your life and wants to spend time with you. Listen, Acts 2, the wind blew. In Acts 4, the room shook. What about Acts 7? Do you remember what happened in Acts 7? Stephen got up to preach, yes? How does that chapter end? That chapter ends with Stephen dying under a pile of rocks. Was the Holy Ghost present? You know what he said? Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Oh, the Holy Spirit was right there. Room didn't shake. No mighty wind. But he was there. But the people didn't react to it like they should have. I remember in the Old Testament, and I'm sure you do as well, when Jacob ran away from home in Genesis chapter 28. He's wandering through that wilderness, and as he gets, as he gets to a certain place, there's nowhere to lay down. He just lays down on the ground. He gathers a few rocks for pillows. He lays his head there, and he begins to dream. And he dreams of that ladder from heaven down to the earth, and angels ascending and descending. And God showed up in that dream and said, Jacob, I am with you. Fear not. I'll never leave. I'll never forsake you. You're going to make it safely. I'm right here with you. And Jacob woke up from that dream. You know what he said? He said, surely God is in this place, and I knew it not. He said, there was an unseen visitor here, and I didn't realize it. He went on to say that this place is the house of God. I didn't even realize it, that God was trying to speak to me because I had expectations. I expected the Holy Spirit to kind of come in a different way. But He's trying to speak to my heart today. Let me, can I ask you to do this? Would you please hold this? Come to John chapter 16. I'd like to show you Exactly how I know the Holy Spirit is there. John chapter 16 and verse number 7. John chapter 16 and verse 7. Jesus is speaking shortly before he goes to the cross. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter... Everybody know who, who, who that is? The Spirit of Truth, right? For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Wonderful. All right, Lord. How do we know when he shows up? Verse 8. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness end of judgment you you know what he does when he shows up he gives them a three point outline sin righteousness judgment remember what Paul preached righteousness temperance not able to control your lusts that's your sin judgment to come 
Oh, it might have been the words coming out of Paul's mouth, but brother, sister, that was the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul as a vessel. Did you know that when the Holy Ghost comes, he rarely speaks of himself? When the Holy Ghost shows up, you know what he does more often than not? It's not, it's not wrong for him to mention himself, but more often than not, he puts all the focus on Jesus. And the Spirit of God, he, his intention is to get people to Jesus and to give them the information they need to get to Jesus, not to entertain them with a bunch of Christian fluff so that you feel good for an hour or two and then are completely empty when you go to work Monday morning, but to give you something real that will get you through the week. In verse number 9, it, Jesus explained it further, of sin because they believe not on me. Did you realize that the reason people go to hell is based on one sin, it's not stealing, it's not lying, it's not murder, it's not pride. You know what it is? It's the sin of unbelief. Because all of those other sins can be forgiven if you'll believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit will point out your guilt and then show you where to find a fix for the guilt and that is in Jesus. You turn that down, then there's no hope. In verse number 10, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. What will the Holy Spirit talk about? He'll talk about the righteousness of Christ. You notice that? He said the Spirit of truth will talk about righteousness because I go to the Father. So that's the righteousness of Christ. You know why Jesus was able to rise from the dead and go back to the Father? Because He never sinned. 100% sinless, completely righteous. Brother, sister, we don't live up to that. The Bible says that there is no difference for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Regardless of how hard you've tried, regardless of what family you were born into or what church you go to, this one, any other, doesn't matter. If you are depending on your good works, it will never measure up to the righteousness of Christ. So Paul would say in Romans chapter 10 verse 3, for they going about to establish their own righteousness... They've not submitted themselves to the righteousness of Christ. Don't depend on how good you've done. Depend on how good Jesus is. In verse number 11, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. He's speaking of the devil. All of the devil's attempts have been shot down. They have failed and one day he will be condemned. The, his judgment is sure. When the Holy Spirit shows up, you know what He's wanting to do? He's wanting to show you that your righteousness isn't enough. You have broken His law. That's what sin is. But you can find help in Christ. And if you don't have Him, you're not going to pass the judgment. When you come back to Acts 24 and verse 25, and it says He reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, I can't help but see the unseen. The Holy Spirit didn't show up and say, Hello everyone, I'm the Holy Ghost, I'm your entertainment today, I'm here to... He didn't do that. He quietly filled Paul and Paul, because he was following the lead of the Spirit of God, he began to speak this truth to Felix and even though Felix had heard it before, did he already know about the faith of Christ? Sure. He had perfect knowledge of that way. He'd heard it before. I don't know how many years he'd heard it. How many years have you heard it? How many years have you been hearing it? But on this particular day, the Holy Spirit reached in and touched his heart. And Felix, listen, the ground wasn't shaking under his feet. It was shaking in his heart. There wasn't a bunch of theatrics and smoke screens and lights flashing. There was a heart trembling. And deep inside he knew, oh boy, something's not right between me and God. You know what Felix did about it? Nothing. He put it off. He brushed it aside. He went right back to the way it was. I hope today that if the unseen visitor has touched your heart, that you do not take that lightly. I hope today that if the unseen has made himself known to you, that you listen carefully to what he has to say. And please know that his desire is not to get you to join a church. His desire is not to get you into the water to be baptized today. That's not it. The desire is to get you to Christ. 
so that your sins can be forgiven so that you can be reconciled and have that relationship with God that he so greatly desires don't be Felix today you say brother Mike but, but me I'm already saved well listen the unseen visitor is very interested in you as well watch how this works righteousness you know what the Spirit of God wants to do in you if you're already saved if you've been born again he wants to live in you and fulfill all righteousness by having control of your life temperance what's that that is the ability to say no to yourself did you know by yourself you can't do that <laughs> did you know you need a lot of help from that unseen visitor to crucify that flesh it says of judgment to come did you know that one day we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and the Holy Spirit will work in you to prepare you for that day so that you do not stand before the Lord with your head hanging in great shame but you can stand before him boldly and say Lord you saved me and because of what you did I was allowed to serve you regardless of who you are today I hope I hope that you're looking for this unseen visitor let's all stand if you would please heads bowed and eyes closed just for a few moments today the music will play softly I'd like you to take a moment to look for the unseen visitor you say brother Mike I don't know where to look how do I find him God give me a great sign from heaven all you need to do is pay attention to what's going on in your heart do you feel that pricking in your heart do you feel that trembling if the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart would you please do something today about it don't let your pride get in the way don't wait for a more convenient time Don't let your religious tradition stop you. Say, but this is how I've always done it. But is that how God wants you to do it? We're not trying to make you any less of a South African. We're trying to make you saved. Some have knelt to pray. If you feel that need, you're more than welcome. If you'd like to come forward, you can do that as well. I want you to be obedient to that unseen visitor. And guess what, by the way? You go to work tomorrow. If you'll listen, if you'll watch, you might just find him there. When you get down to pray tomorrow morning, if you'll listen close enough, if you will be still, you might just know that he is God you might need to take some time out of your incredibly busy schedule to find God in whatever place you're in I'm going to pray and close the service, but as I do, I'd like to make sure that we're praying for the right people. If you've come today, but you have never given your heart to Christ, you've never trusted His sacrifice as the payment for your sins. Maybe until today, you've just thought that you've done good enough you've tried your best you believe that Jesus is real but you've never asked him to save you I'd like to pray for you today I'm not gonna point you out I'm not going to embarrass you but if you would just raise your hand you can put it right back down I would just like to know who I'm praying for All right, this is just between you and me I appreciate that thank you thank you thank you I appreciate the honesty anyone else like I said just going to pray for you 
Would you be honest? Just, just for a moment, be, be honest about this, please. Before we're done, you can open the door of your heart and ask Jesus to come inside, even right now. Say, Lord, I got it loud and clear. I understand. I'm not good enough to go to heaven by myself. My good works aren't enough. Lord Jesus, please come in. Save me. Your death pays for my sins. Would you do that? Father, thank you this morning for being our unseen visitor. Thank you for sending the Spirit of God. And Lord, you are allowed to work however you want to work. Whether that be in a, in a mighty wind or an earthquake, Lord, you can just speak in a still, small voice. Father, help us to be mindful of the invisible. As Moses was able to endure, help us to continue on in our lives knowing that your presence is real. Father, would you please, I want to pray for these hands that went up. Before this day is over, might they have Jesus living inside. God, might they not be a Felix. Might today be the first step in becoming a Paul. Thank you, Father, for working amongst us today. And I pray that you bring us back tonight hungry, ready to learn more. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.